So our next speaker is Dr. Gregory Ahrens, who is a clinical and organizational psychologist and professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, um, as well as the director of the Child and Adolescent Services Research Center there. And his research focuses on aligning and testing leadership and organizational support strategies and training supervisors to become effective leaders in supporting evidence-based implementation and sustainment in behavioral health. And we're going to ask him to help uh, kind of bring that over to the, to the cancer domain. So please welcome Dr. Aaron. Hi, good morning. Good to be here. Got to have a nice run this morning and really nice weather. So, one from San Diego. Good praise. Love it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about a few things um, implementation of organizational intervention. Um, I want to acknowledge um, a lot of my funding is from um, NIMH, NIDA, uh, the CDC, but also some foundation funding looking at things like how you bring to people together in collaboration to support um, implementation of evidence-based care and evidence-based practice. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our uh, work we do around leadership and organizational change strategies. Um, and the strategy that we've developed is now being tested in four different NIH trials, different um, types of behavioral health problems, different settings, school settings, um, addiction, mental health, uh, and another study I'm going to talk about rolling out um, trauma treatment across the entire country of Norway. Uh, so, you know, you see a fair amount in the literature about um, organizational theory, organizational interventions. Um, and we see much more about theory than we see actually testing those theories. Um, a lot of the, and I think uh, management, organizational psychology comes from uh, survey research. And you know, one of the points I want to make is that we need to be really testing our theories, testing those organizational theories. And I think uh, one of the reasons that you don't see a lot is because it's really hard to do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in just a moment, what we call our chaos scenarios, uh, which you have your very carefully planned study or carefully planned project, and um, as soon as you start, and maybe before you started, things change in the health system, in the hospital, on the teams, uh, with people. Um, and as I can think and work in this space, uh, I originally started, you know, thinking about working with teams, working at the team level, and then realized, well, maybe we need to think about the larger organizational level. Gee, well, maybe we need to think more about the, the really broader context, the systems and the policy systems in which healthcare and allied healthcare operates. And so, you know, we did this piece in Annual Review of Public Health on um, aligning leadership across systems and organizations, really trying to take that, that big view. Um, but going back to my point about doing the uh, this review down here at the bottom that was published in Implementation Science a number of years ago, it was a systematic review of organizational culture change in hospital settings, medical settings. And they you know, started their review, I think identified something like 1,600 titles. They ended up with two studies that actually tried to change something. So again, a pitch for let's let's go in and try to change, but use use theory, but not theory that's divorced from our knowledge of what's going on in the trenches, right? So theory is great. We have to link theory with our knowledge, which means being engaged in the settings uh, where you want to work and knowing enough about them that you can kind of make some educated guesses about what might be important. Um, so also in implementation science, many frameworks, and thank you for bringing that up, Sylvia. Um, and, and frameworks are sometimes static and sometimes, like, and we need to think about how frameworks um, interface with the area that you work, not just the kind of disease area, but the service systems, the types of hospitals, the clinics, the people um, that you work with. And so this uh, EPIS impl exploration, implementation, 
or preparation implementation sustainment framework is both a process framework and what they call a determinant. It means there's lots of boxes with stuff in them that we should attend to. But the idea here also is that uh, we move through these phases of implementation as we're thinking about bringing in change to healthcare systems. Uh, and while we're thinking about that change, we need to be thinking about what's going on in that outer context, the service system, the policy, policy level, uh, in terms of leadership, the socio, um, socio, um, I don't know, the socio-environmental policies, funding, contracting, formularies. What's the FDA doing? Impact, uh, you know, what you're trying to do, those kind of larger outer context. And then what's going on in the inner context of organizations, right, in terms of leadership, internal policies, uh, quality and fidelity of the interventions that you're using. Um, the staffing, the teams, the way teams uh, are organized, uh, the quality of leadership among those teams, and the individual characteristics of the providers and, and patients that are interacting. But more and more as we're doing this work and using this framework, we're thinking about this idea of bridging factors. So what are the factors that are bridging the outer context in the inner context? Uh, and some of the things that emerged in this recent systematic review was the idea of community academic partnerships, um, the role of purveyors or intermediaries around practices, around um, new interventions. It could be devices, it could be medication. There is definitely a role um, uh, in bridging that outer and inner context. And then the nature of the innovation itself of what you're trying to implement or what you're trying to, to change. So I like to think back to you know, Amy Edmondson's studies of implementing minimally invasive cardiac procedures and looking at the best predictors of that, and it was really the nature of the surgical teams. And if those were egalitarian teams where uh, the physicians and the, and the rest of the staff practice together, work together, and that sense of psychological safety in, in those teams that allowed people to really kind of move ahead and be more uh, effective in implementing and sustaining those minimally invasive procedures. So in, across those levels, uh, you know, different uh, health systems, different organizations have a climate and a culture uh, that can that. But as Sylvia mentioned also, there's a lot of variability in teams within those settings. So I think it's helpful to have frameworks that you work from that help have those lists, have those constructs that you think about, but then really from your knowledge of what's going on in the trenches, really how does that relate and how does it come up with your theory of change and your organizational intervention that you might be using. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about um, the work that we've been doing on leadership and organizational change for implementation, what we call our loci intervention. And this really began um, with engaging with um, program managers in the behavioral health space. And one of the things we heard uh, frequently from this group was that, well, one day I was a clinician, then I was a manager. I didn't really get much help and support in becoming a leader. Um, you know, I learned kind of regulatory stuff, how to tick the boxes, uh, performance evaluations, but not really kind of leading change and leading implementation. So we took that to heart and um, got some support from uh, the NIMH to develop this leadership and organizational change. But as we were thinking about that, one of the challenges for us was to think about how do we use evidence-based business and management um, to really implement evidence-based care or to evidence-based care. So we went back to the work of um, Bernie Bass and um, Bruce Avolio in thinking about you know, transformational leadership, transactional leadership, um, well-researched models. But then thinking about the context, we really thought about you know, where do we want to focus on kind of leadership improvement? Definitely at uh, multiple levels. But one thing that's often overlooked is what we call first-level leaders. So those who are really supervising, leading the practitioners, the clinicians, and staff who are interacting with patients on a daily basis. And so um, Priestland and Hannig in 2005 in the Harvard Business Review talked about the importance of first-level leaders 
and how organizations really need to support those. So already thinking multiple level across those organizations. And so in our work, we're thinking about how we use focused or um, strategic leadership to develop a climate for the use of new practices and evidence-based practices as we're trying to implement change. So you know, just to summarize you know, the model uh, working with and adapting and developing all the time, use this idea of full range leadership, that transformational transactional leadership uh, with implementation leadership. What are the specific uh, behaviors of leaders to communicate the importance of a strategic initiative, that they're knowledgeable about what you're implementing, that they're proactive in problem solving, that they're supportive of their staff, that they persevere uh, through the ups and downs of implementation. Um, which interestingly, we're doing some work with some folks in China and trying to translate these measures and that perseverant leadership translated into um, staying the course through the joys and sorrows of implementing change. Yeah, very apt. Uh, but, and then also being available. And then also working, um, working with the concepts of Ed Shine, who is a um, management scholar at MIT, who talked about these culture and climate embedding mechanisms. So what do leaders do at different levels in the organization to communicate the importance of a strategic initiative? So for example, audit and feedback, what's being audited and what's the feedback? That signals that the focus of that is something of value to the organization. Is there incentivization, role modeling, teaching and coaching, resource allocation, those types of things? So the LOSI strategy really tries to encompass all of these as we kind of move forward. Um, and so what does LOCI look like? Typically, it's a six month to a one year um, program uh, in which we train first level leaders in both uh, full range and implementation leadership, but it's all based on 360 degree assessment. So we're really coming in, getting the land first, understanding not from the leader's own perspective necessarily, but from the staff perspective, uh, what are the needs, what are the developmental needs, in terms of leadership and climate for a specific practice, and then develop plans, have ongoing coaching, also work with organizations to support those leaders so we're not trying to do change um, just isolated. And this just rolls out over the course of um, one year as we're doing with reassessment and then recalibration, so kind of these longer term PDSA cycles um, to really move the process forward. And so um, the chaos that I mentioned briefly, um, one of the things that happens quickly is things change. So if you look at number one, I don't know if you can read it, but um, the loci leader who's been trained in loci transitions to supervise a control team, right? So what do we do? And, and our group has had to say, and does this happen um, in the first four months between four to eight months and eight to 12 months, we've wanted to have a systematic way to say, when these things occur, how do we deal with these in a way that's consistent? Because this is part of a research study. Um, we want to do it consistently so we can track that. Um, so that's just one example, the, the transition. Um, another uh, is that a control counselor is promoted to be a leader on a loci team. Right, so if that happens early in the project, the new leader is given access to webinar uh, resources. Uh, we start feeding back data to them and do training. So we've just had to, to document all of those as we go forward. So uh, I'm gonna do a whole talk on chaos at a conference later this week. Started. <laughs> because we've had leaders who um, were demoted and then one of their subordinates was promoted to be their supervisor. How do you handle that? What does that mean for the dynamics of a team? But in implementation science, we think a lot about, uh, you know, determinants, mediators of how we get there and that applies to our implementation strategies as well. So in, in this case, implement leadership at the organizational level, work group level affects climate, um, also affects attitudes towards implementation, what we call implementation citizenship behavior, uh, 
and hopefully fidelity of the intervention that we're implementing. Now, um, there have been multiple applications. I'm going to talk briefly about loci being adapted for Norway. Uh, we were contacted by folks in Norway. Their task was to roll out trauma treatment across the country. So we are working with them, uh, loci on the translation. Uh, they've translated all the materials. They're doing the training. We're coaching them and supporting them in a step wedge design as it rolls out through the entire country. So it's what we call a hybrid type three design. The clinical interventions are well proven, um, but the loci implementation strategy and the adapted version are being tested as we roll out um, over time. Uh, but similar determinants, targets, and meters, mediators, and the main thing I attend to here is that we try to do this in a way where we're thinking across levels as we go. What are the multiple influences and bi-directional influences across levels that we need to attend to? And so we're working on uh, actually a revision of a proposal now where we're working with uh, a statewide behavioral health authority uh, where the state came to us and said, we want you to come and do leadership training. And we said, well, yeah, we'll do that, but we want to work with you to set the policy stage, to set the funding stage that's going to help support this initiative. So for me, you know, having worked in this space for quite a while, I, I think more and more that it's going to be more and more important to think across those systemic levels. And our strategies uh, need to consider the influences at those multiple levels and how we can act to influence how well that alignment occurs and activities can support what you're trying to really get to is you know, how well you're doing your practices, how well you're doing your clinical care. Um, but it really is a complex system and the big challenges for me is communicating that to reviewers and study sections. You know, because well, why don't you just focus on changing physician behavior change, you know, or nurse behavior change? Well, they operate in this complex system, and so we need to think together about how we engage the entire system and, and get the buy-in and support that's needed um, to affect real change. So I'll stop there. Thanks. minutes for question and answer, and what I'd like you to do is to please identify yourself for the folk on the webinar. And if the folk on the webinar would like to send in a question, there is an email. So we encourage you to hear from you as well. Everyone's ready to go out and do multi-level interventions. I can see it. it One thing that struck me as you were talking is, is kind of the work you're doing when you're implementing these kind of interventions are, uh, you kind of already are working with an organization that kind of really is interested in implementing these kind of, of interventions. And I guess kind of how do you even get to the point if, if it's kind of where someone's ready to kind of implement change? Is there kind of work to do before you even start? Yeah, so you know, there's a recruitment process that, that we go through. Um, the main thing I want to say about that is um, that you understand kind of the instrumentality of uh, the agencies or organizations you're working with. What is it that motivates them to be involved in the problem? Uh, so for example, if the project is going to train all of their providers in an evidence-based practice, then they don't have to pay for that. And that meets a policy directive that they should be prepared to do evidence-based That may be their motivation. And so the level of engagement of those folks in kind of the larger idea of changing the climate of the organization may be secondary for them. So uh, when we're engaging them, yes, they may be motivated uh, to be part of the, but uh, it's really kind of working with them uh, over time, uh, making sure that you're present for them, hearing their needs and be responsive. Uh, to their needs as well. So we have another project that's uh, uh, funded by WT Grant Foundation 
that's uh, what we call the Community Academic Partnership for Translational Use of Research Evidence, CAPTURE, my best acronym ever. Uh, and, and it really is uh, us giving up some control as researchers. And the, the project has been going some, in some unanticipated directions. And so I think for, for that engagement, you also have to be willing to, um, to shift. Right? It can't be all about the researcher kind of dictating the whole process. Yeah. Sylvia. I'm really thankful that you sort of raised this point because I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about it. Um, uh, right, so as researchers, we, you know, we write a grant, we have a fabulous research question that we say that we can answer, we get money from the finding agency, and we have basically a commitment that says these are the hypotheses or the research questions that we were paid to answer. And then you go out into the field and you learn that the motivations for engaging the organization are completely and perhaps even antithetical to the research questions you have laid out and are being paid to answer. So can you talk a little bit about that tension and how you sort of resolve it successfully without alienating both sides? <laughs> sure. So one of the things we do, um, because part of the work involves what we call the awesomes, the organizational strategy meetings, is we elicit what can we do for you? So, you know, we have some resources as part of this project, and it may not be fiscal resources, but we have, you know, people. We have, so, we'll, uh, maybe your request, well, we want to know about this in our organization, you know, X, Y, or Z. We can build that into our organizational surveys and give them feedback um, about that. So, that's, that's one instance. Or, you know, we also try to make the case that if, if you're learning, uh, way to bring about change in your organization and really support that. It doesn't have to be just for this initiative, but it's something you can use down the road. But um, yeah, in you know, one of the things that's kind of minus and a plus, that, you know, we have a kind of a, a one-year process for LOCI, and I think we're just getting going after a year. So. Um, be a longer time frame in our, our capture grant um, is much longer term. There is more um, opportunity for us to prove to collaborators and our colleagues that we're there with them, for them, and going through the process together. But that really has to develop a, a little bit over time. So this, I think the sooner you can try to communicate those messages that you're working with them, not at them or at odds, the better. We have a 15 minute break and we're going to start again at a quarter to 11. So get up and stretch, go outside and enjoy a really beautiful full day. <laughs>